This is the first of three programs which deals with an area of geology not touched on in the Planet of Man programs, evolution and fossils, the history of life. Evolution is one of the great ideas of science and it's also important to biology as well as geology. In fact, it illustrates very well how the two areas, biology and geology, come into contact. It's only through geology that one can really demonstrate evolution demonstrated by studying the fossil record. The origin of life is another geological problem that's shared by biologists and also by chemists, by biochemists. In this hour, we shall look at the origin of life and evolution. Fossils, as well as being very useful for putting rocks in their correct position in the relative geological time scale, in other words, into a geological system like the Cambrian or whatever, also have a story of their own to tell. They have the story of the history of life to tell. And the very beginning of that story is obviously the origin of life. And if we're to look at the origin of life on the surface of the Earth, then clearly we have to look at the conditions on the surface of the Earth, at the state of the oceans and the state of the atmosphere at the time that life might have originated well back into the history of the Earth. Let's see what we can tell about the early atmosphere and the early oceans by looking at some very old rocks. There are three kinds of rocks that can tell us a great deal about the oceans and the atmosphere early in the history of the Earth. First, this banded iron formation, which in fact comes from Tomogamy, just north of North Bay. Then this uranium ore, which is from Elliott Lake and is essentially a sedimentary conglomerate. And then these red rocks. The one on the left is a very old red sandstone. And the one on the right is a piece of schist from the present day, which is weathered red in the present day atmosphere. Now, let's begin trying to draw conclusions by looking at the uranium ore from Elliott Lake. It consists of pebbles and sand. As I said, it's a conglomerate. But mixed in with that sand are some grains of pyrite and some grains of uraninite, and it's uraninite which is the uranium ore. But if we were to look at the sands and gravels of present-day streams, in other words, the modern equivalent, of the sands and gravels which accumulated at Elliott Lake 2,300 million years ago, then we would never find pyrite and we would never find uraninite because the oxygen dissolved in the stream water causes the uraninite and the pyrite to break down. So a conclusion we can draw from the Elliott Lake conglomerate is that at the time it accumulated, there was no oxygen dissolved in the streams which carried the sand and the gravel and therefore there was no oxygen in the atmosphere at that time. What conclusions can we draw from this banded iron formation? Well, the bands consist of alternating rich and poor layers of iron oxide. The black layers are rich in iron oxide, the reddish layers are much poorer in iron oxide. This rock accumulated as, sed as a sediment in a sea, and in order to accumulate, that iron oxide in the sea, it was necessary that there be periodically oxygen in the water to produce the black oxygen rich bands. So there are two conclusions we can draw from these two rocks. One 2.3 billion years old, the other one just a little bit older. 
Now then, what were the gases if they weren't oxygen in that atmosphere? Well, they may have come from original gases that were retained by the Earth from the time that it accreted from particles of dust and gas at the time of the origin of the solar system. We think that's unlikely because one of those gases would be neon. And we have at the present day only one hundred billionth of the neon that we ought to have if those early gases were retained. The other source that those gases may have come from is a volcanic source. Look at this example of basalt lava. In it are many gas bubbles. The gases emitted during a volcanic eruption are very hot and acrid at perhaps a thousand degrees centigrade, and special piping has to be used to lead the gases away from the vent because of their heat and the acidity. The gas can be collected in quite ordinary glass flasks, which are then taken back to the laboratory for analysis. Volcanoes, of course, are quite unpredictable, and a quick retreat is very often a wise move. Surprisingly enough, over three quarters of the gas emitted is usually water, with a substantial content of carbon dioxide and sulfur dioxide as well, and then some nitrogen and hydrogen, sulfur and chlorine. If, uh, if you think that's dangerous and foolhardy, I wonder what you'd think of two Russians who sailed down a lava flow on a raft of basalt in 1938 in order to collect volcanic gases. If the atmosphere then was composed of gases erupted from volcanoes and contained no oxygen, then we're left with a problem. We're left with the problem of where did the oxygen come from, which was available in the water at the time that the iron formation was deposited. Well, the answer to that problem probably lies in fossils such as this. You see these layers here, rather dark compared with the intervening light layers. Well, the dark layers are layers of algae. They were once a rubbery sort of scum. And the light layers between the dark ones are layers of mud that was washed onto the top of that rubbery algal layer. So it's in algae that existed at the same time as the iron formation was deposited. Not as complex algae as the one you see here, but simple relatives of this one, that we look for the source of the oxygen. One of the places where algae are most in evidence is on the seashore. The seaweeds, the brown and the red and the green seaweeds of the surf zone are algae. They have deeper water relatives, which are brown and green and red, and they function in the same way. They use sunlight in order to provide the energy for their life process, for which they use carbon dioxide and water. They have humbler relatives, which one can isolate in a drop of any dirty water from a pond. These humbler relatives also function in much the same way. They use sunlight, and they have chlorophyll in them, and they use carbon dioxide and water. This single-celled algae lives and dies and reproduces within a single-cell wall. They're very beautiful, and there are many, many thousands of varieties of such single-celled algae in both the oceans and in fresh water. This one is much thinner than a human hair. Here, the chlorophyll, which uses the sunlight in the life process of the algae, is present as dark patches within the cell. And here, the 